Hello and welcome back. My name is Victor Magariño and in this video I'm going to be making a formal presentation of the work that I have done for my master's thesis in economics and this work is a theoretical and empirical analysis of the question of profit rate equalization taken as a subject for the empirical part of the Norwegian economy. Now before going to the actual presentation allow me to say two things. First of all, if you're interested in reading my work, if you're interested in having actual access to the thesis, please send me a formal request, whether by email or by DM in Discord or in Twitter, and I will be very happy to uh, make it readily available to you. Now, in the meantime, uh, I am going to be looking at other ways of uh, making the thesis public, but indefinitely I am going to be asking you to come to me to request a version, uh, a copy of the thesis, which I will again uh, very happily uh, provide to you. Now on a second note, I am going to be making uh, an AMA stream particularly dedicated to this question, to the work that I have done in this thesis. So uh, you should, uh, if you have any questions, you know, write them down, prepare them, because I am going to be making a, a, a specific stream where I will be addressing all your questions, where I will be going into more details on this particular subject. So if this is a subject that is interesting to you, and there are some things that come up uh, during this presentation that, uh, or during your reading of the thesis that you don't understand, that you'd like further clarification on, please write them down and I will be answering your questions in a a stream that I will be making uh, most likely in August, in late August. Uh, so again, stay tuned for that. And uh, if you have any immediate questions that you need to ask, you can always formally, you know, ask them uh, in Discord or through uh, the comment section or uh, email or any other uh, way you can contact me. Uh, but without further ado, let's go to the presentation. Okay, so allow me to begin by describing the aim and the theoretical framework that I adopted in the thesis. Uh, and first, let's say that uh, the aim of this paper is to provide an in-depth, both theoretical and empirical analysis of the question of profit rate equalization, especially as it relates to the broader question of uh, theories on capitalist competition. And in particular, we are going to be looking at the theory of real competition, okay? Now, the empirical analysis is carried out on the Norwegian economy. So the subject taken for the empirical part of the paper is the Norwegian economy. That is an important subject since it is a profit-driven capitalist economy that is generally regarded as a highly competitive one. And this economy has also been notably understudied so there are virtually no papers looking at uh, this question uh, using Norwegian data, and especially we consider both average and incremental rates of return. So this is certainly a, a, a country that was important to look at, and this is the reason why it was taken as a subject for my thesis. And again, so the theoretical framework is the theory of real competition. That is the modern synthesis of the classical insights into capitalist competition that has been, uh, uh, the synthesis has been developed by Anwar Shaikh. And in the paper, I briefly contrasted to the theory of perfect competition and to the general uh, approach of imperfect competition. So just to motivate a little bit the discussion, um, one of the main themes of the paper is the centrality of profit, okay? And the reason for this is that profitability within the theoretical framework of real competition is the driving force of capitalist economies. And in this sense, competition is the mechanism okay, by which the dominance of profitability is enforced in capitalist economies. So the analogy that I like to make in this sense is that of the theory of evolution, where competition plays the role of natural selection and profitability plays the role of the reproduction of the species. And within the world of profitability, Profit rates are really important indicators because they give us the percentage of businesses or an industries or an economy's costs that are earned in the form of profit. So in this sense, they not only account for the total mass of profits, they also tie that mass of profits back to the costs and they make 
these profit rates are those a relative measure of profitability and the relative is relative to costs which makes it important not only for theoretical purposes but also at a practical level in financial practice for example rates of return or rates of profit have been looked at uh, very carefully so a fundamental question okay of uh, profitability is especially if we look at the classical and marxian tradition a fundamental question is whether or not profit rates tend to get equalized across economic sectors and this question okay has been whether implicitly or, or explicitly present in most of the major economic schools since the times of the classical economists the thing is that um, these schools have dealt with this question in extremely different manners. Some schools, like the neoclassical school, don't even explicitly look at this question, although they assume a certain uh, answer to it, okay, and, and I discuss it in the paper. Uh, but again, the theoretical frameworks are all over the place. So there are many different answers, many different theoretical uh, uh, frameworks from which this question has been analyzed. So in this paper, what I try to do is I present a cohesive account Okay, which is the account of the of the theory of real competition, and that is the one that I defend uh, uh, theoretically and empirically. So the contributions are the following. Okay, the contributions of this study are first and uh, first of all, is the systematization of a novel uh, econometric approach to the investigation of profitability differentials that is centered around, but is not limited to us. I'm going to be discussing the autoregressive distributed lag or ARDL modeling approach to integration analysis okay and it is not limited to it so we are going to see some uh, some alternative estimation uh, methods now the empirical analysis okay uses data from the Norwegian economy which again it is a highly relevant economy but one that has been understudied. So this is another contribution. Then the time span covered by the data is 47 years. So 47 time series observations are present uh, for 26 industries. And okay, the, the time period considered is 1971 to 2017, which is among the larger time spans that have been covered in the uh, literature, uh, which is uh, certainly a, a, a good for uh, making long-run inferences and we also have observations after 2010 which uh, no paper that I have seen uh, looks okay at uh, observations after 2010 uh, in this uh, for the question of profit rate equalization so um, this is uh, again another contribution and then uh, this uh, methodology that I systematize does uh, something that uh, an alternative methodology that has been presented in an unpublished paper uh, earlier in 2001 by Zachariah. Uh, in this paper, okay, they also allow for the composition of the total profit rate differential uh, of a given industry, okay, between two components. But what I incorporate is not only that I do that, okay, with an with an alternative approach, but also that I uh, interpret the main components of the total differential uh, in a way that I argue throughout the paper is. Uh, much better okay uh, actually it's an interpretation that changes even the way in which we est in, in which we empirically test for profit rate equalization okay because Zachariah is uh, uh, gives a different way of looking at uh, the hypothesis of profit rate equalization uh, and this is certainly an important difference that is a contribution because uh, what I argue is uh, for a much better interpretation of these uh, coefficients so uh, just to give uh, a brief uh, uh, theoretical uh, uh, description of the theory of real competition uh, in this theory okay competition is not a state as in perfect competition where competition is just some kind of a of an equilibrium stat static point uh, in the theory of real competition competition is a process and it is a warlike process where firms are active price setters and, and cost cutters okay and this more like a uh, struggle is turbulent in nature and therefore gives rise to turbulent phenomena now the theory okay with regards to profit rate equalization considers mm -hmm. two main analytical stages the first analytical stage is competition within an industry and in this stage first we distinguish between the price setters which are the firms and the cost determinants 
which are the capitals. Now the capitals here are, are seen as the plant and equipment okay, used in the production of a given um, good okay, in a given industry. And this distinction is important because the firms are the ones that set prices, but the capitals are the ones that determine the costs. So within firms, multiple capitals indeed can be employed. And across firms within an industry, multiple capitals can be employed as well. So if there is a tendential equalization of prices uh, across the firms of an industry, and this is something that the theory of real competition predicts, okay, a tendential equalization of prices uh, across firms. Um, if this is the case, but capitals differ in costs, so they represent different costs, and we take into consideration the fact that profit rates are functions of the unit prices and also the unit costs and the capital intensities. If we then find that there is a tendential equalization of prices, but there is no such tendential equalization of the costs and the capital intensities across capitals, then there's going to be a dispersion of profit rates earned on the different capitals within an industry. And this is going to be a natural dispersion that arises not from monopoly power or, or all of those things. It, it rises naturally from the fact that some capitals, okay, even if everything else is kept constant, some capitals are older and therefore represent higher cost, uh, costly methods. So methods are more, more costly than others. And the newer capitals are therefore going to represent, uh, okay, theoretically, the, the, low, the lower cost methods of production. And just, okay, on the distribution of the vintage of the capitals, we already find a reason to believe that there's going to be different capital, uh, different costs across capitals, which implies therefore a natural distribution of profit rates within an industry. Okay. Now, if we look, however, at competition between industries, we will find a tendential equalization, but this takes place at the level of regulating capitals. Okay, and uh, and this is an important. Uh, point here because investments into an industry and within an industry are profit driven okay and normally investors look at the best generally available method of production to invest to right so this is a method of production uh, represented by capitals that are reproducible so that their investment can actually flow there so there, there are no patent rights or whatever patent rights can certainly exist but they there are some methods of production that are not going to be patented and those okay are the ones that where new investment generally tends to go right because uh, it can legally and, 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 and economically it can go there and then okay they and they are the best in the sense that they represent the least costly methods of production so those are the ones that are targeted by new investments and therefore, if profit-driven invest investments target those regulating capitals, so the capitals that represent this best generally available method of production, then an arbitrage process is expected to exist between industries where there is an equalization of the profit rates earned on the, those regulating capitals. right? And this arbitrage process works as follows. An industry that earns a higher regulating profit rate okay than the than the other industries is going to see an inflow of capital into that industry that makes supply in, in that particular market grow faster uh, relative to demand okay therefore there's going to be a downward pressure on the price and since the profit rate is increasing in the price if the price decreases then there's going to be a push downward of the profit rate as well to the average and the opposite effect is going to take place in industries where there is a lower than average uh, regulating profit rate now what this implies is that only in the case where the average uh, profitability conditions in an industry re reflect the regulating profitability conditions will we expect there to be an equalization of average profit rates Otherwise, we do not expect there to be an, an equalization of average profit rates. However, we always expect there to be this long run tendential equalization of regulating profit rates. Okay, this is indeed what we expect there to see in competitive capitalist economies. But again, competitive within the theory of real competition, not within some perfect ideal uh, competition. So then let's look at the econometric, the formal econometric testing okay, of this question. 
and we're first going to look at a method that has been commonly used in the literature and this one was developed by the Austrian economist Dennis Muller who uh, made a, a lot of improvements in the in the econometric testing of profit rate equalization uh, throughout the, the, the 80s okay and, and his work has been highly recognized and this is why this method has been uh, widely used although he did also uh, propose uh, other methods but this one, okay, consists of the following. First, we uh, model the long-run value of the i industry's profit rate. So the profit rate of some industry, okay, that I call the i industry uh, at time t, okay. So this is a time series model. We model it as uh, the long-run value of this profit rate. We model it as the sum of the average profit rate, or so the let's say the general profit rate. So the profit rate. Uh, that represents the, con the profitability conditions in the general economy uh, which is generally the, the combined average of all profit rates in, in an economy plus some structural idiosyncratic premium right? that is uh, specific to that given industry now if we take this model then we can uh, do the following thing we can, we can take the, the series of the deviation of the industry specific profit rate so the profit rate earned in, a, in the i industry the difference of this profit rate by the general profit rate okay we can take this different series that i call here uh, i call here uh, pi prime and we can uh, do the following thing so we first start with this equation here and we slightly uh, uh, modify it until we get this expression and what this is is an autoregressive model of first order okay where the autoregressive model here is on this variable and this variable is again the difference series the deviation of the industry specific profit rate from the general profit rate at a given point in time and this is modeled in the following way in equation two is modeled as a constant okay here this alpha times one minus beta plus the slope coefficient times the first lag of the deviation series variable and this uh, this here is a, a white noise okay this is just a, an error term so then this model in this model what we're interested is in estimating okay so this beta has its own interpretation but uh, okay you can look at the paper uh, for the interpretation but the, the really the important part here is the alpha okay the important part is that the the, lo the total long run premium of a given industry uh, in terms of their profit rate and what we want to do is we want to estimate it so what we do is we run this model okay we run this autoregressive model we estimate the constant and the param and the slope parameter and then we divide the constant by one minus the estimated parameter and there we get okay this statistic the, the alpha i and then uh, with a, a formula that i have in the paper uh, you get the standard error so that you can do hypothesis testing okay you can test for the statistical significance of this of this statistic and that is uh, certainly what we want to do here so then the second approach is the following we start okay with an ARDL model that takes this form okay in equation three mm -hmm. takes this form and what we're modeling is the ith industries profit rate okay as a function of uh, its lags, its own lags, and the lags and of the general profit rate. And this general profit rate here is just the combined average of all profit rates without including the ith industry's profit rate, okay? Now, this model, okay, we can subtract the first lag of the, of the dependent variable from both sides, and we can get this expression, and then we hypothesize that in the long run steady state, uh, there's going to be no change between one year and the other in the profit rate so the change is going to be equal to zero and also that there are no shocks so the shock uh, the, the, the the white noise here is just equal to zero and in the long run okay we then get this expression where uh, we model the i industry's profit rate as a function in the long run as a function of the long run general profit rate and this function okay has this following form where uh, it's just okay a, a normal uh, linear function where these are the long run coefficients okay the ARDL long run coefficients that for anyone that has studied uh, time series econometrics knows 
that this is the form of the ARDL long run coefficient. And uh, if we want to get the total profitability, profit rate differential of a given industry, uh, of this ith industry, then in equation 5 we can see uh, that we just subtract from both sides of the equation the general profit rate in the long run, okay? And then we get this total long run differential, okay? And this is how we can estimate the total long run differential with this expression where I have decomposed it. We can see that this is the composition. Uh, tells us that the total long run differential is a function of the long run general profit rate and the non dynamic and the dynamic differential. Okay, where this is the form of the dynamic and the non dynamic differentials, which are just functions of the long run parameters. Okay, so here the way that I interpreted this is the following so the non dynamic differential tells us the profitability, uh, the, uh, the profitability differential that would exist in the in that industry absent any other uh, profitability factors from the general economy okay absent those factors without looking at the general uh, economy the idiosyncratic uh, differential would be this one okay it is non dynamic because it is not related to the general profitability conditions in the economy at least not directly related However, then the dynamic differential is related to it. And we can see in this expression that it is related in the following manner. So this, uh, this uh, parameter here is telling us the long run impact of a change in the uh, general profit rate on the industry specific profit rate. So what this uh, dynamic differential tells us is how large this impact is relative to the case where the impact is a one-to-one -one impact, okay? Where the one percentage change in the long run general profit rate yields a one percentage change in the, uh, or per percentage points change in the uh, uh, industry specific profit rate, okay? So this is what uh, this parameter is telling us. And the way in which I interpreted the interaction between these two parameters is the following, is that in a competitive economy where there either average profit rates or incremental profit rates get equalized, okay, if they are equalized, then these two components should cancel out. So the total long run differential is what we're looking at. We are looking at whether this is statistically significant, uh, significantly different from zero or not. And if it is indeed not statistically different from zero, then it means that these two things here cancel out. And the reason why this is the case is because there are some idiosyncratic things, okay, factors in the industry that make it so that maybe, okay, let's say this differential says that the profit rate should be lower than the uh, than the general, so this there should be a, a, a negative differential. But if this is the case in a competitive economy, the adjustment of the industry-specific profit rate to the general profit rate should be larger than one so that this term here, the dynamic differential, becomes positive and statistically significant and thus it cancels out with this other component. Okay, This is the way that I interpreted uh, the, this interaction. And we can see that this interaction is telling us that the total long run differential is a weighted combination, uh, a weighted average of these two differentials where the weight given to the non-dynamic differential is just one and the weight given to the dynamic differential is the long run value of the general rate of profit that I proxy by the average of the time series of the general profit rate, okay, for, for each of the of the industries, of the 26 industries. And here, okay, I, there are some alternative uh, alternatives to this methodology, okay, depending on, on the needs that you have. Uh, and these are the following, okay, so uh, very quickly. So, um, in order for the ARDL uh, procedure to, to be applied correctly, there should be a long run relationship between the industry specific profit rate and the general profit rate. Now, this, uh, this the testing for this long run relationship is done with the bounce test, okay, the bounce test. And if the bounce test finds that there is a long run relationship, but this long run relationship exists in the model where this is the regressor, and the general profit rate is the regressant, so it's dependent, the dependent variable, then what we need to do is we need to uh, change the order of the variables in the original model, and what we're left with is this 
new specification of the total long run differential where just the, the sign is just the thing that is changed okay because you're just changing the order but the 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 method of estimation is the same okay? it's just the same the rdl method however if the 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 bounce test finds okay that there are no long run relationships between these variables and these variables are non stationary okay the alternative uh, method that should be used is the Engel Granger method okay and this is and this is what I argue in the paper is that what you should do is just run this equation okay the, the static uh, regression in in equation 8 by fully modified OLS and then uh, employ the Engel Granger cointegration test if there is cointegration then you can rely on these long run parameters that have been estimated by the fully modified OLS uh, if not, then you cannot trust it. Okay, so then the, there is indeed the possibility that you are left with some industries for which you cannot indeed uh, rely on the estimated profitability differentials. Okay, and that is one of the limitations of this uh, methodology that I that I have systematized. Another uh, alternative case is the one where the variables are stationary, but the bound test finds two long-run relationships between them, in which case we can also theoretically not trust okay the, the the results of the ARDL regression and what really what you can do is just uh, estimate the equation 8 by least squares and since the variables are stationary uh, the least squares estimation of this model is already giving you the long run coefficients okay so that, that is the way in which you can do it so then let's move to the empirical evidence okay and in this regard uh, allow me to say the following first Average profit rates, okay, are just the ratio of an industry's aggregate total profits to, okay, its aggregate capital stock. Okay, that is, this ratio is the IT industry's average profit rate because you're looking at the aggregate profits and the total stock of, ca of capital in a given industry. You're not looking at a specific set of capitals, okay, you're looking at the aggregate uh, uh, profit and capital. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, this profit rate can be measured empirically with the uh, with these categories of the OECD stand database uh, in the following way. Okay, this equation ten here gives us okay the, the formula that I use to to compute the average profit rates. And here, let me just point out that this term accounts for the wage equivalent of the self-employed, which is important uh, uh, to measure correctly. Uh, total profits in, in a given industry, okay? And this has been done in, in other papers. So this is how the, these profit rates look for the 26 industries that I that I uh, look at. Uh, and here, okay, the these are the, the the identifiers, okay? These letters are the identifiers of the of the industries. But if you want to look at the full names of the industries, you can uh, read the paper because I have there a, a list with all the names. Of the industries together with their identifier and uh, basically these profit rates okay they look relatively clustered together they certainly cross a lot back and forth but nevertheless they they tell us okay already from the beginning that there could indeed be some industries earning okay uh, in like this one for example higher than average uh, uh, profit rate a higher than average long run profit rate and there are some industries that, that could be earning a lower than average uh, long run profit rate. So uh, this is also uh, seen if we look at the deviation series. So the series that look at the deviation of each individual profit rate from the from the combined mean, from the combined average. And uh, um, these are the deviation series used in the first approach. And these ones basically tell us more or less the same thing. Okay, they 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 cross the zero line a lot, which is good for profit rate equalization. Okay, but nevertheless, some are persistently below it, or or, or they seem to be, you know, they seem to show okay some tendency to go uh, above it. And and this is okay, what we would expect if there is. Uh, there is some kind of a tendential equalization, but a very weak one, which is one of the things that we could expect of average profit rates, okay? And, and these are the ones that we're looking at right now. So then let's just uh, go directly to the evidence. So this is the evidence coming from the first approach, okay? And here I have estimates of the constant 
of the of the uh, uh, slope coefficient, okay, of the autoregressive coefficient, and then an estimate of the long run premium uh, of the long run premia for all of the industries. And here is the R square of the regressions. And uh, uh, I'm going to be skipping, okay, the details. Uh, of the of this estimation of the the trending of the series the the testing for the unit roots and all that I'm going to be skipping that but let's just focus okay on this long run profitability premium and their statistical significance okay and in the parentheses we see the t ratios and if they are greater than 1.96 okay so the 5% significance level then uh, we can see that they become statistically significant, taking the 5% significance level as a, as a reference. And here you can see that most of them are not statistically significant, but that there seem to be some that are, okay? And this uh, profitability premium, we should contrast this to the ones given by the second method, which is something that I'm going to be uh, doing in the, in the next slides. So this is the results coming from the second method. And this is pure. This, these are the results purely from the ARDL model. These are the the F statistic of the F bound test. Okay, the F bound tests that uh, find the long run relationship. And here, let me just say that uh, I decided to take the 10% significance level, uh, and in order to uh, conclude that, in order to reject, okay, the null hypothesis of the non-existence of a long run relationship between the variables. And this is the long run. Uh, this is the test with the long run relationship being uh, the ith industries profit rate, uh, the dependent variable, and the general profit rate being the independent variable. And this is the uh, f statistic of the f, f, f bound test uh, with the reversed relationship. Okay. And what you want to see is a unique relationship. Okay. Only one of these should be statistically significant for uh, for the industries. And uh, if you find both, you cannot rely on the on these estimates, and if you find one, you can indeed rely on them. Uh, but if you don't find any long run relationship, you can also not uh, rely on them. That is why I omitted some of the results. Now, in the ones that uh, in for the series where the, the the profit rates and the general profit rates were um, non stationary, okay, the win which I estimated the non-dynamic differential, the dynamic differential, and the total differential were in the following way. So I looked at the the other procedure that I suggested, the Engel-Granger procedure. This is the tau statistic of the Engel-Granger cointegration test. And these are the estimated uh, uh, profitability premia with the uh, fully modified OLS uh, estimation procedure. And here you can see that only in two industries uh, we can find at the 10% significance level uh, a long run relationship. So I took these results, and this one, the the you can see that it gets very close to the 10% significance level. So um, just okay to to be able to compare it to the other uh, results, to the results from the other approach, I decided also to include this one. Okay, this is something that uh, I also decided to include, and. If we compare okay, these results, this is what we would see for the average profit rate. So first of all, uh, look at these two columns, okay, these two columns here. Uh, first of all, there are some industries that we could not uh, include in for this second ap uh, approach. Uh, and this is indeed a limitation of this second approach, which is that you're going to be uh, having to omit some of the industries because you cannot find long run relationships or because you find two long run relationships where you should only find one and uh, but in the ones that you can actually estimate you can see that the story seems to be more or less the same okay they seem to be telling us more or less the same story both in terms of the sign of the of the deviations okay of the of the profitability premium they seem to be also telling us in the magnitude okay you can see that the magnitude seems to be more or less the same and they also are telling us a similar story in terms of the uh, statistical significance of this profitability premium. Okay, so again, this one is the one that was obtained from the first approach, and this is the one that was obtained from the second approach. And these are the components. Okay, these two last columns are the components of this long run premium. So then let, let's just focus on the following thing. First of all, most of these profitability premium are not statistically significant. If we combine the two methods, okay, if we combine the, the 
the profitability premium that are statistically significant with the first method and with the second, okay, we take the union of the two sets, what we find is that at most 12 industries exhibit statistically significant profitability premium, okay, out of 26. So we are not even reaching the, the half of mark, okay, of the, of the set of industries which suggests certainly that there is a tendency for profit for average profit rates to get equalized in the Norwegian economy. Nevertheless, this is not a very strong tendency because still 12 industries showed okay, a, a statistically significant profitability premium. And we can see that across the methods, okay, they seem to be telling us more or less the same story, but there are slight differences. Okay. Uh, some some of the some of the of the um, uh, statistically significant uh, premium are not uh, met by the two methods. Okay, for example, in this industry, in industry 12, you see that even at the 10% significance level, uh, the two methods do not agree. They agree on the sign and the and the magnitude of the differential, which in this case would be uh, a, dif a profitability premium of minus five percentage points okay in both cases minus minus five percentage points this would be the interpretation uh, but they do not agree on the statistical significance even at the 10 percent significance level okay these are the t ratios that are reported in parentheses so what this means is that uh, in this particular instance they do not agree on the statistical significance but okay what i decided to do is in the cases where they don't agree uh, for uh, robustness, okay. What that I, what I decided to do is I decided to take if at least one of the two methods yields a statistically significant profitability premium, then that industry is regarded as having a statistically significant profitability premium, okay. But in most cases they seem to agree, okay. They seem to agree. In this case, for example, industry six they agree at the ten percent significance level, but in the, in industry five they agree at the five percent significance level. So there seems to be a general agreement, which is uh, good for robustness because you can see that by using two distinct methodologies, the results are more or less the same, okay, which is good. And then if we focus on these two uh, columns, we can see what I hypothesize should be the case uh, in my interpretation of the, of the two components of the total uh, differential, which is that they should have, first of all, opposite signs Okay, so if the non-dynamic differential says that, for example, industry three should have a, statist a positive and statistically significant long-run premium of 6.6 .6 percentage points, what the non-dynamic, sorry, what the dynamic differential would tell us is that the the industry-specific profit rate of the of industry three should indeed adjust to the movements in the general profitability conditions of the economy in a negative and large manner so that it cancels out, okay? And in this case, you can see that this is exactly what happens. So that this is a statistically significant and large enough, okay, to weighted by the general long run profit rate, cancel out to get cancel out with the non-dynamic differential in such a manner that you can see that the total differential becomes not statistically significant and you can see that this is again remarkably close to the counterpart of the first method so the method that i develop here is very 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 close to the first method which is, which is again very good for robustness because two methods are agreeing on the on the same conclusion and the methods are distinct so now let's go to the evidence on incremental rates of profit okay and here is where the interesting part comes in terms of the equalization of profit rates. Because before, for average profit rates, we saw that there is indeed some tendency, but it is a weak tendency, okay? It is a weak tendency, but, but it exists, okay? It seems to exist. Now, in terms of the uh, regulating profit rates, the regulating profit rates are approximated by the incremental profit rates. And the incremental profit rates are basically, they, they try to, again, they try to... Um, estimate the regulating profit rate in an industry and the way in which this is done by Anwar Shaikh is the following is you look at the ratio of the change in profit rates in, in the profit in the total mass of profits in a given industry from one year to the other 
and you take the ratio of that to the investment made in the last year. So this profit rating is in a sense the profit rate on newer in, on, on the last investment, okay, on the newer investment. And this okay profit rate on the newer investment is supposed to approximate the regulating profit rate in an industry, which is why this sign okay is just an approximation sign. And uh, this profit rate has a lot of advantages in terms of uh, its interpretation and in terms of uh, the, the its computational power. So we can actually compute it quite easily, and, and this is the case uh, for Norway as well. Uh, and again, using the uh, these variables from the OECD stand database, okay. Uh, and now we're looking at the gross operating surplus, okay, because we in this case we cannot look at net operating surplus as in the previous case because we're looking at gross fixed capital formation, whereas before we were looking at the net stock of capital. And uh, the way in which uh, these profit rates were calculated is, is just uh, with this formula, where again, this term accounts for the wage equivalent of the self-employed. And um, this is the change, the total change in profits from one year to another at time t. And this is the investment, this gross fixed capital formation gives us the investment made in the previous year. So then this is how the incremental profit rates look. And you can see, uh, some uh, features here are, first of all, that they seem to be uh, potentially more clustered together than the average profit rates, but they nevertheless show a lot of volatility, okay? They show a lot of volatility. So uh, here, for example, you can see that in, the, in, in this industry, the profit rate in this in this uh, year rises a, a lot, okay? The, pro the incremental profit rate. So, uh, and, and in, but in this other year, for example, it is very, very low. Okay, so low that I actually had to omit it from the from the graph uh, because otherwise the scale would have been too large. And in this case, um, what you can see is that they cross a lot, okay, which is good for for equalization, uh, the the crossings back and forth. And they also seem to show again so uh, this uh, general okay tendential equalization that seems to be stronger than in the case of the average profit rates. Nevertheless just a visual inspection of this graph doesn't really tell you whether or not they are uh, tendentially equalized uh, more strongly than the average profit rate. So for that, we need to look at the formal econometric testing. So looking at the deviation series, we see the following thing. Uh, we see that they cross a lot, the zero line again, and indeed they cross the zero line a lot more than in the previous case, which is again good for equalization. And you can see also that they do not seem to diverge significantly from it. But there are some cases where they do, okay? There are some cases where they do, like in this one, okay? There are very large differences here, even though the graph doesn't seem to show this visually, but, but the, this difference is large, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's close to minus three, uh, which, which would suggest, you know, a very large uh, percentage devi uh, deviation in percentage point. Uh, of the profit rate, and in this case, you see that it goes to minus 15 here. And again, the volatility, okay, these profit rates are very volatile, as is expected, okay, from the theory of real competition. So going uh, to the evidence, to the formal econometric testing, we start again from the first approach, okay, the first method, and these are again the, the results from the constant, the slope parameter, the autoregressive parameter, and the, and the total long run premium, Okay, of the of the ith industry, and here you can see for the twenty six industries that I that I have in the set, and you can see already from 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 here that these um, are very small compared to the other ones. Okay, so you can see that these uh, profitability premium are smaller. Okay, and that they are not statistically significant uh, as much as in the earlier case. You can see that there are some like this one, like for example, industry six, that are still statistically significant. But here, the statistical significance reduces to just a couple, whereas before it was 12 industries that we found were uh, had a statistically significant uh, profitability premium. So then we look at the second methodology, okay, the, in the, the second methodology in this case, okay, uh, I'm, uh, what happened is that the ARDL uh, model yielded uh, because all of these variables, by the way, are stationary, okay, all of these variables are uh, highly stationary, uh, what happens is that the ARDL bounds test produced a long-run relationship between the industry-specific profit rate and the general profit rate that was 
uh, that, that uh, gave two long-run relationships between these variables and therefore the preferred methodology was just to estimate the static regression that I showed earlier. Um, the, the preferred methodology was to estimate that uh, static regression with least squares uh, estimation procedure and then to just estimate in, in the standard normal manner this uh, coefficient. So this is the way that I did it in this case. So in this case I didn't employ the ARDL uh, procedure but rather just the, the, the least the least squares procedure on the static re regression in order to um, to get this uh, profitability premium and the components of it uh, and in this sense um, it, it's a lot easier okay for uh, interpretation and also uh, to get the standard error okay it's a lot easier but all of these details I discussed them in the in the paper the important thing is right now just to look at the at the comparison okay across the two methods and in this case because we were just running the static regression with uh, least squares we could indeed estimate uh, on these stationary variables we could indeed estimate all of the premia for all of the industries so in this case we didn't have to omit any industries okay from the from the analysis which is a, a, an advantage okay an advantage of of this um of of this uh, of of the incremental profit rates okay and if we look at the uh, at these two columns as before we say that the results seem to be telling us even now even even more closely the same story okay the the story is more or less the same you can see that both in terms of the sign of the deviation here it's positive here is positive as well here is negative here is negative as well the same here so you can see that the sign matches in most of the cases and also the magnitude you can see that the, the differences are very, very, very small. And in some instances, they're even pretty much the same. Okay, so this is certainly very good for robustness, again, because you can see that two distinct approaches are giving us the same results in this case. And now, in terms of statistical significance, there is only uh, one case, I believe, where there is uh, this difference, which is uh, this this uh, particular case at uh, Industry 24, where they uh, seem to diverge, okay, even at the 10% significance level. However, for example, in Industry 23, uh, the durations here show that at the 5% uh, significance level, the, these two methods diverge, but they do not diverge at the 10% significance level, which is good, okay, it's good. Uh, but in this case, they do diverge even at the 10% significance level. Uh, so there's only one case where these two methods produce different results. But in any case, you can see that at most, looking at, at these two uh, approaches uh, and combining the two as I did before, you can see that at most three industries, sorry, <clears throat> so you can see that at most three industries exhibit a statistically significant profitability premium and in, in this case we have this one industry 6 we also have in this case industry 23 and industry 24 okay but in the case of industry 24 this is a very small uh, profitability premium of minus three percentage points okay but nevertheless okay it is statistically significant so we should take it into consideration but the most notable of these is the one in industry 23 which industry 23 is financial and insurance activities uh, and I give a brief explanation as to why I believe that uh, this differential might be so large but you can see that this is a very large differential indeed okay in, in this case it should be of around 30 percentage points okay 30 percentage points is larger than all of the profitability premium that that were statistically significant in the case of average profit rates so this is certainly uh, something to keep into consideration and something that we should look at. And when I looked at why this industry may have this very large and positive statistical, statistically significant profitability premium, uh, what I basically found is that this is an industry where there is a high concentration okay, of, mark, of the market share in a few industries, in a few firms, sorry. sorry and I also found that uh, there, 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 there could indeed be there could indeed be some barriers to entry in this industry. Uh, so this is certainly uh, maybe why even the regulating profit rate, even the incremental rate of return of this industry, doesn't show um, 
uh, a tendency to get equalized to the rest. But nevertheless, in the entire economy, the tendency is strong. So even if there is, you know, uh, one or two outliers, the general tendency with 26 industries seems to be there. Okay, the, there is indeed a tendency. And if we look at these other two columns, we see that the story that I provided of there being, you know, uh, a tendency for these two components of the total differential to uh, cancel each other out is indeed true here as well. Okay, this is certainly the case even even uh, for the incremental rates of return as expected, okay, as was expected. So you can see here that the improvement of this uh, methodology that I systematize here and that I have developed here is basically that it can tell us the mechanisms behind these results. So in the earlier studies, only this was looked at, okay? Only the total differential was looked at, this alpha. However, what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to in a sense, be able to make inferences as to why these results are how they are. And these two components tell us this particular thing that, that, that I wanted to, to, to give, which is, uh, again, what are the internal mechanisms within the industry that make it so that the particular profit rate differential of a given industry is the way it is. So we can see, for example, in the, in the case of Industry 23, where we noted uh, that there was this very large and positive uh, premium, that the reason why this is the case is because the non-dynamic differential is very large, okay, you can see that it's of 0 0.38, uh, uh, so it's of 38 percentage points, and the E is statistically significant, and that the, that the dynamic differential is not nearly large enough in, in absolute value, it's not nearly large enough to compensate for the very, very large positive uh, and non-dynamic differential. So the reason why in the end we find that in this industry there is a statistically significant and large profitability premium, total profitability premium, is because there are some idiosyncratic factors in that industry that are making uh, the this industry earn a very high profit rate relative to the rest, okay, and the adjustment of this profit rate rel to the general profitability conditions in the economy is not nearly uh, large enough in absolute value, okay, because this is a negative uh, uh, thing, is not nearly enough, uh, large enough in absolute value to compensate, okay, to cancel out with this other component. And this is the reason why. And this is certainly, again, a contribution of this paper because it allows you to uh, give a story behind these differentials, okay? The reason why these differentials are the way they are. So the conclusion, really, the empirical evidence is telling us that the, there is a much stronger tendency for profit rates to get equalized in the regulating sense, or so in the sense of the regulating profit rates, than in the average profit rates. But nevertheless, the average profit rates do show a certain tendency to get equalized, which suggests that the average uh, uh, profitability conditions in the economy, in the Norwegian economy, are not very far apart from the regulating ones. Because if they were, then we wouldn't ex we don't expect there to be this this you know striking similarity in terms of that both show a tendency to get equalized but this tendency is much stronger in the regulating profit rates, once again. So the conclusion that I, that I uh, derived from all of this was uh, the following, which is that there is indeed strong empirical evidence to suggest in the Norwegian economy that there is a tendency for profit rates to get equalized, even if you look okay, at the average profit rates, although this is much weaker than the incremental rates of profit, which are the ones that are theorized to be within the theory of real competition to, to show uh, um, a strong tendential equalization. So the theoretical implications are obviously that we can model okay, the Norwegian economy assuming okay, this um, uh, equalization, tendential equalization of profit rates, which is important if we are, for example, going to uh, do uh, empirical studies on the labor theory of value, because in this case, then we can see that there is a strong empirical grounds to use prices of production, which are pr uh, prices, okay, the prices of production are the prices that embody not only the labor values, but also that equalized profit rate, so this is uh, the, the important thing, uh, and, and you can see that we can model the Norwegian economy and we can create models 
where the labor theory of value holds and at the same time assume okay that the labor theory of value holds with its version of prices of production okay with the version the marxian and the ricardian version of prices of production so this is certainly a, a, a strong okay um, empirical finding that we find here that has indeed theoretical implications and also there are some policy implications which are basically that there are indeed there is at least one industry here that shows um, some uh, some you know very large profitability premium which okay for policymakers in Norway could maybe uh, you know be a sign that there may need to be certain um, policies implemented to uh make that industry more competitive because it might be the case that this differential here is due to non-competitive forces okay so with this uh, i end this presentation again if uh, you want to read uh, the entire paper with all the details and with the detailed explanations uh, you can uh, send me an email you can send me a dm on twitter or on discord and I will be happy to provide the, the thesis. And uh, yes, uh, with that being said, I will be doing uh, once again an AMA, uh, stream AMA, where you can ask me any questions that you may have on this uh, particular question. And with that being said, uh, this is the end of the presentation. I appreciate your time and, and uh, the interest. And, uh, I will see you in the next video.